Welcome to the Dietitians Unplugged podcast with Aaron Flores and Glennis Hoyston. Join us as we explore the idea of health and wellness from a new perspective. Each episode, we will discuss topics that will help you improve your health, body image, and fitness without obsessing on the scale or counting calories. We believe in health at every size, intuitive eating, and body positivity. And we want to help you build the confidence to ditch the scale, embrace your health, and unplug from the world of diets and body shame. Bienvenidos al podcast de Dietitians Unplugged, episode 24. <laughs> okay, no, this episode will still be in English. Um, this is... <laughs> that was my awesome, was pretty awesome. DJ voice yeah. for Mexico. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh my God, if this thing with Dietitians Unplugged does not, <laughs> yeah. walk, does Call. not work, Call I'm you. sending that as my sizzle reel <laughs> and I'm getting a job. <laughs> this is episode 24. This I've, is episode 24. I have like... Almost zero Spanish knowledge, which is shameful. I didn't really say much. <laughs> I think you could probably. I think you said twenty four. There you go. That. Right. Yeah. So welcome back, and we are going to talk today about something that's been on my mind lately. As I get older, we want to talk about aging and how that affects our world, and our body image, and eating, and how we think about ourselves and our place in the world. Absolutely, and I think it's um, a really important I, it's a it's a i hadn't been thinking about it a lot but i'm really happy that you brought it because you're us. a dude uh, do male privilege right check it right there <laughs> um no absolutely I'm, I'm really happy that you brought this to to my consciousness to think about um and and it has something that it has been something that has sort of in very indirect ways come up in my in my office so i'm happy that that you've brought this for our listeners okay great yeah and um I'm going to talk to somebody I've gotten to know online, Michelle Vigna Baltus, and she has a group that I'm in, uh, which she'll talk about at the end of her interview, but we kind of shared this article recently that I had seen in another group, and it was about aging while female is not your worst nightmare, um, and it really hit home to both of us, and we can post the link to it um, in the show notes, but one of the quotes that really hit home for me was, for me, aging as a woman in America is less about injustices done to me than it is about a subtle undermining of my place within this society and a not so subtle disrespect that pops up more with each passing year. It's just sort of, to me, hits home about this invisibility. Somehow we are, you know, it's in, in the same way that it's like, oh, a woman's angry. Are you in your period? Which I think is the most insulting Thing. It's like, oh, you couldn't be mad unless you were on your period. It's like, well, that's weird because I must have known lots of men on their periods my entire life because right. there's been a lot of crabby dudes that I've had to deal with. Um, so we're going to talk to Michelle, who I got to know recently. And um, she has, she is, let me talk about her. Yeah. Michelle Vigna Baltus is a food and body relationship specialist. Her passion is to help women shift their mindset so they can finally live without con the constant preoccupation with food and their bodies. She was imprisoned by chronic dieting and body hatred for decades, but now has a healthy relationship with both food and body. Michelle jo enjoys all foods, including kale salads, green juice, ice cream, and cake. She believes that all foods and bodies can fit in our lives, and that value is never measured by a number on the scale or our clothing size. Michelle is a certified intuitive eating counselor, emotional freedom technique, EFT, level one and two practitioner, and a certified holistic health coach. She empowers her clients to cultivate healthy lifestyle behaviors instead of worrying about weight and size using the intuitive eating model. She offers one-on-one -on -one private coaching and group coaching in person and remotely to women all over the world. So she kind of does a lot of what we also do. And Absolutely. She, she's really cool. So um, we had gotten to know each other online and we were like, hey, let's both talk. And so we, we talked and it got around to like, we started talking about our gray hair or how she was letting her hair go gray and mine's coming in gray and how we were reacting to that. And then it got like, you know what? Let's talk about age. Let's do a podcast about age. And I was like, that's perfect because I think about it all the time as I'm, you know, middle-aged now, officially, definitely. And yeah, and it really does affect how I operate in the world. And I'm trying to not let it, but that's the reality right now. Yep. Yeah. And I think it was, a, it was a great discussion with her. So I'm really looking forward to sharing it with everyone. And I, here it is. I hope you enjoy. 
Hey, Michelle, it's so nice to have you on the show, and it's so nice for me to talk to you again. We talked before. Um, why don't you tell us, well, we know what you do, but why don't you tell everybody else what you do? Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Glennis. Hi, Erin. Um, thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Uh, as Glennis knows, I am a big fan because every time I listen, I always send her long, detailed emails about what I love about the podcast. So thank you for everything you guys are doing. Uh, in answer to your question, I do um, similar work to what I think both of you are doing, which is helping women to overcome Oh, the imprisonment of food and body image issues uh, and really to help them understand that food can be our friend and that we don't have to fear it and we don't have to be on diets and we don't have to hate our bodies and all those icky kinds of things that many of us struggle with for so many years. And so tell us a little bit about how you came to this. Like what, how long have you been doing this and, and what brought you to this type of work? Well, I came to this type of work. I, I really do feel like this is my calling, you know, because I struggled with food really since I, as long as I can remember. Uh, as early as four, I remember, you know, overeating to a point of extreme discomfort and uh, dieting as, you know, as early as elementary school. And, you know, that just continued through all throughout my adolescent years, teen years, and through college. You know, I didn't realize that I really had a, a relationship issue, you know, with food and that we were not friends at all, you know, and I was misusing food to, I was a chronic, chronic emotional overeater. And um, I was misusing food in, a, in some very, very unhealthy ways. And I also was chronically dieting. And so after college, I, you know, I guess I had more time and I explored, you know, many different things to try to heal myself. And after doing that for another couple of decades, uh, I got in touch with intuitive eating. I was looking, I think, for like another dieting book or something. And, you know, the way things turn out, intuitive eating came up in some, somehow in Amazon and I got the book and I read it and I said, there is no freaking way that this is going to work because they don't understand how much I can eat. And for me to say, you know, just eat when I'm hungry and just stop eating when I'm full and to embrace all the other wonderful things that the intuitive eating philosophy embodies, I was like, this is not going to work for me. So I tried it on my own and I was very unsuccessful. And I felt that, well, you know, I think it can work. So maybe I just need some help. So I uh, found a coach, found an intuitive eating um, coach. And she was also um, someone that I was following on Facebook for a while. She was really into body image and just so powerful. And I really admired her work. And we worked together for a little while and she set me straight, you know, on like, this is what it is and this is what it isn't, which I really needed help with. So that's kind of how I found it, you know, and I was already in school at the time to, I was switching careers from being uh, in the corporate, corporate America. And I was already in school to be a health coach uh, and emotional eating really was my big, my specialty, my niche. And, um, when I found out and started practicing intuitive eating, I sort of switched gears, you know, a lot because I understood that a lot of what I was thinking about food was really not uh, the way I wanted to continue and the direction I wanted to go in. So when I realized that intuitive eating and um, was what I wanted to do in terms of how I wanted to live my life, you know, and change my lifestyle, I um, really embraced that. And uh, went through the formal training to become an intuitive eating counselor. And I uh, did my mentoring with Elise and with Evelyn. And it was a great experience for me. Um, so, you know, now I do a lot of work with women who are looking to ditch dieting, you know, and to feel better about the foods that they're eating, to feel better about their bodies, um, you know, and embrace all of that beautiful stuff that comes with letting go of uh, living in diet world. 
So I, I wrote down one of the things you said, because I love it so much, is when you read Intuitive Eating, that sort of natural skepticism that a lot of us had, I had the exact same thing. And the what I loved you sort of saying is, um, they don't know how much I can overeat or how much I, I can eat. And yes. I, I, I love that comment so much because it expresses so much of the skepticism I see with my clients as well is mm-hmm. like, if you really let go of the rain, if I really let go of these reins, you don't know what you're about to exactly. unleash. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I, you know, that, that you that you could articulate that in just such a, a beautiful way right there is really important because I think that is, again, the ambivalence that people come to intuitive eating with and that I wholeheartedly embrace. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, I used to joke and say, you know, I've heard people say, oh, you know, so-and-so can drink anyone under the table, you know. And I would I would turn that around and say, I could eat anyone under the table. Like, the, the amounts of food that I used to be able to consume was really unbelievable. I mean, especially in college because it was all included. So it was <laughs> like every day was a buffet, you know, and I mean, just no consciousness whatsoever of hunger. Uh, it was all my hunger was based on the time of the day. It's 12 o'clock. Okay, it's time for lunch. I didn't even know what it was to be hungry. And to be full was, well, when they closed down the kitchen, that's when you're full. Yeah. Um, so it was like this never ending, like being stuffed all the time. And it wasn't very pleasant looking back at the time. Of course, it was my norm. Uh, so when I found intuitive eating and like you're saying, it was like, they don't know who I am. You know, these people have no idea. Um, but lo and behold, it works for me. So <laughs> It's a miracle. It, it and it almost is, right? I had the exact. By the way, yes. I, I had the exact same freshman experience. Uh, my uh-huh. dorm was um, a, an all-you-can-eat buffet every meal. Like there was uh-huh. no points. I didn't have to count points. I didn't have to like have a <laughs> budget on my meal plan. It was like exactly. we open for breakfast at six and we close at ten. We close <laughs> again or we open up again at eleven thirty. And like you could go in as many times as you want. And I was like, exactly. I just moved into hometown buffet. Exactly. There's obviously something about the young person's um, experience of eating kind of away from your family and on your own for the first time that especially if you don't if you don't sort of grow up with a um, a really solid food foundation and then you sort of go like I didn't and I went off to college and um, which was actually I lived at home. So what we would do is we'd have a three hour lunch on Wednesdays and all my girlfriends and I would go to whichever restaurant had the buffet that day. And I just remember eating. It's like you said, you don't know how much I can eat. And I just remember eating so much. And I wasn't a dieter back then, but I was a chronic overeater. And that's how Mm -hmm. I dealt with a lot of things in my life. But Mm -hmm. one of those things had been, I never ate food that I enjoyed growing up. And all of a sudden Mm -hmm. I was in control and just was Mm -hmm. eating and eating. And it would be like, it's so much fun to stuff ourselves and like be so sick later. Like, uh, oh my God. And not even like, I mean, it was Pizza Hut bar and Ponderosa mm-hmm. salad bar. And <laughs> it wasn't even like gourmet food. And, and, yeah. and like, and for those who speak intuitive eating language, right? That's our rebel. That's our, that's our rebellion. And, um, and s- same thing like that, that freshman year was like, oh, no one's going to control what I do. Like, no one's right. going to tell me, oh, I can't have Fruit Loops, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. And so it's that, it's, that's the diet rebel right there. Like, we got to live the diet rebel. Yeah. Right. right. And, you know, my mother was, she was a nurse. And so, you know, she had a clue about nutrition. So, you know, our house, we didn't have any, in quotes, junk food. You know, that wasn't thing that we had in the house. My mother couldn't eat your vegetables, blah, blah, blah. And looking back on it, you know, she thought she was doing a great job and she was, but the way I translated that when I went to college was, oh, they have cookies here. Wow. Never had those in my house. And I'm going to have lots of those and Fruit Loops and everything else. Like Aaron was, it was just like, and again, there were no boundaries. So you could do whatever the hell you wanted and nobody was, oh, what about your vegetables? Oh, no, no, no. That was not on my radar at that time at all. You know? Yeah. So 
um, I mean, it's so interesting that sort of shared experience that we've all had uh, mm-hmm. at that time of our life. And maybe it was just like also developmentally appropriate. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So we have kind of talked about this experience that we all had as young people. And then Michelle, when you and I, we, we talked a few months ago, um, cause we're like, Oh, you know, we do the same thing. You're cool. I'm cool. Let's talk. And then we had a nice, um, video conference chat and, um, we could have talked for ages and yes. we didn't even get to the subject, but we kind of touched on a little bit, like how aging really affects our body image. Um, Mm -hmm. and just sort of how we function in the world. And it was like this kind of, for me, it's kind of a new experience in the last few years to really start to see things change on my body, um, just my face and then just how I feel. And now can I share, can I share our ages? I'm totally fine with that. Okay. So you're, you're 51. Yes, I'm, I just turned 51. Yes. Happy birthday. Mazel tov. <laughs> and <Thank> I'm, you. <laughs> I'm turning 46 in May. Mm-hmm. And I'm 22. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally not true. Times two. <laughs> <laughs> now the accuracy comes in. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so we thought, wouldn't that be great? That Because surely there's got to be a lot of our listeners out there that are also sort of grappling with, you know, once you get to body acceptance... Um, if you're not in that sort of, uh, age changing bracket, and I feel like that's your forties, your fifties, you know, where it's like, oh, you do not look like you did in your thirties. Um, Mm -hmm. it like throws a monkey wrench into everything that you've done in terms of accepting our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and even like eating changes, eating has changed for me. You know, I can't eat like that 20 year old person in college. Yeah. 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 And so what's yes. what's your experience been with sort of, you know, aging into middle age? You know, I look at pictures from when I was in my 30s, and I got to be honest with you, I feel like I look the same. I, maybe I'm in denial. I don't know. <laughs> but my haircut is very similar. Uh, you know, my hair has been short for a number of years. And I don't know, like I look at myself. Uh, to be very honest, I don't have a lot of wrinkles on my face. You know, people tell me that all the time. I, I guess I'm aging, you know, as they say, pretty well. I, I don't really know what that means, but I feel like I look the same. My body um, is doing kind of what it wants to do, but I, I don't know. I'm kind of embracing it as I, I when I decided that I was going to work toward having a healthier body image, I began to understand that that also included the aging process, you know, which was not easy, you know. Uh, So for me, it's like, yeah, okay, things look a little bit different and things are going south and they will because that's just what happens, you know. Uh, And I stay fit and I love to exercise and it makes me happy. And I I move my body the same way that I used to when I was in my 30s. I choose different types of movement because I've changed. And it's not because I'm older. It's just because I have different needs now than when I was in my 20s or 30s or whatever, even 40s. And I am okay with that. You know, I just... I'm like, okay, that's just not my style anymore. And I don't beat myself up and say, oh, that's because you're old. I say, that's just because I'm different now and my needs are different. And I just embrace that, you know, um, as long as I'm healthy and I'm fit and I feel good with the movement that I'm doing, that makes me happy. You know, that's, that's what I focus on. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm finding I'm having kind of the opposite experience where (laughs) everything looks different than my uh-huh. in my 30s. Part of that mm-hmm. process was I gained weight from giving up mm-hmm. dieting and and I mm-hmm. went back to my original pre-diet weight and mm-hmm. but it was different. Like I was this weight when I was in my 20s and it didn't bother me one little bit. Like <laughs> things, things are just different, you know. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. and you know, my face is like really changing it's not like wrinkles mm-hmm. but just like the skin mm-hmm. is changing mm-hmm. and it's like oh everything just looks really different like mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. really and so to me it puts another wrinkle in the body acceptance part of it mm-hmm. where it's like yeah okay I'm not just like 
fatter and still younger and I could deal with that. It's like, oh, at the same time, I'm bigger and mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. am also, oh, gee, I'm older too. And un- unlike you, like I just find I can't move my body in the same mm-hmm. way that I could in my 30s. Right. Yeah. Well, it- well, you know what? It's possible that I can't, but <laughs> I don't get hung up on it. Got it. As long as I'm moving my body, that's all I care about. And at this point, I'm able to do, I'm still able to do the things that I enjoy doing. So that makes me happy. And I I do my best not to say, oh, yeah, but back in the day, you would do like an hour long spin class and not even be sweating. Whatever. (laughs) I don't care. I, you know, I still enjoy cycling. No, I don't do spin classes because it doesn't appeal to me. Not because I can't do it, but because it doesn't appeal to me. So, you know, I don't know. It's just a switch. It's just a change. Um, you know, I shared with you, Glenn, is that I, one of the things I'm doing to embrace the aging process, and I may change my mind, but <laughs> for today, I'm letting my hair color grow out. Woo-hoo. I'm letting my hair go natural. And... I have to frequently check my motivation. You know, why are you doing this again? (laughs) Because when you see like the roots are like, ugh, you know, but I got to be honest with you. It's very liberating to just be what it's going to be. You know, Um, I, and and the other thing is that, you know, graying hair is not always an indication of aging. I mean, some people just have gray hair, period, you know. Uh, so it's just one of those things where I'm like, so what? I have gray hair. Who cares? Who am I? Who am I kidding by coloring my hair? You know, my hair is gray. Oh, well. Well, and it's such a double standard, right? Like, yes. it's just accepted that every woman will color her hair when it starts to go gray. Like that's how I, for the rest of her life, for the rest of her life. Right. Even though you're like, you're 80 and you've got this dark brown hair, the the (laughs) hair of a 20 year old. And you're like, you're, (laughs) you're totally fooling me that you're not 80. (laughs) You know, it's like, um, yeah, yes. the the cat's out of the bag. And, and for men, there's like almost no hair coloring products, right? I mean, it's not. Very few. It's very few. I think they have to buy women's hair products. Yeah. Well, well women. They have, should... in, they have just for men. Right. They do have a product. I don't know how many. We right? get a, so have a product. A product. Yeah. <laughs> the irony being, product, right. yeah, the irony being yeah. like hair dye is hair dye. Like, right. Why? Does it know do gender? It's better for women. What's that? It doesn't matter if it's for men or for women. It's hair right. Dye. Which just goes to show you that hair dye is almost exclusively marketed to women, even exactly. though men could use the same product. And so it yes. just goes to show how reinforced this idea that you should hide your aging mm-hmm. um, is. But just for women. But just, well, yeah, yeah. obviously. Women should just age. Yeah. Yeah. This is patriarchy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Patriarchy alert. Like George Clooney gets to be sexier as he get old, yes. he gets older, but Meryl Streep gets to play only grandmothers. So when people, you know, it's, I, I do, I will be totally honest and say that I feel a little uncomfortable because I'm in transition right now with my hair. Yeah. So every once in a while, like when I'm with people and they're kind of looking at my hair, because <laughs> right now it's like met several different colors. <laughs> so it's a little weird, you know? Um, so. I sometimes say to people, oh, by the way, I'm letting my hair grow out. <laughs> it's like, you know, just so you know, um, I, it's not that I haven't gotten to the salon. I just, you know, I yeah. am giving it up. And, and I didn't do this on purpose. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. And they look at me like, wow, you're really brave. And I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me tell you, this is not easy, you know. Um, and thankfully, my husband, who is white, his hair is completely white. He's 54, has a full head of hair. Um, and I think he's the cat's meow, you know, he hates his, his silver hair, oh, you know, wow. and he, when he, but he looks at my hair and I say, Oh honey, I don't know if I can do this. I'm like, this is getting a little rough. You know, he's like, Michelle, I think it looks beautiful. I'm like, all right, now you're my guy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he supports it. He totally supports. He understands why I'm doing this. Um, he reminds me when I, when I forget and I just feel strongly that it's part of the natural process. And, you know, I'm, I meant to say earlier, Glennis, you know, when I didn't, when I started intuitive a number of years ago, I did put on some weight. And again, I don't think that's necessarily, you know, people always associate like weight gain with when women are getting older. And that 
isn't always the case. I mean, it does, it does sometimes happen, but you know, my weight gain came from, you know, so many years of being on diets and restricting. And then all of a sudden it was like, woohoo, we're not restricting anymore. My body found its natural weight, you know, and I've been this weight many times before, you know, so I'm just like, okay, I'm good here. Yeah. But again, comfortable. And, and again, yeah, the, I, the weight gain might kind of happen any time in your life, but it does, yes. uh, you know, for a lot of us, it'll happen, you know, 40s, 50s as we're getting towards, for women, as we're getting mm-hmm. towards menopause. But the other thing is the shape for a lot of people change. Yeah. So I've heard all my friends who have gone before me into those years complain about the belly and, mm-hmm. you know, lo and behold, I am there and now I have a belly that I didn't have in the same way before. And, and part of my challenge has been to recognize that, Hey, this is just what happens to women sometimes, not all of them, Mm -hmm. but a lot of them like that's as our hormones downshift and change. Like, and so it has been part of it. like just accepting that this is the aging process. So, you know, um, and and I think the key to that, first of all, I always had a belly. So I, I think that my belly has definitely gotten a little bit bigger um, or a little, I don't know, a little whatever. It's definitely changed. I've never had a flat belly, so I was never used to that. But I agree that it is part of the process. And again, it's it's that whole focus on like the outsides. Yeah. So what? Right. You know, so I have a belly. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? I'm a bad person? Yeah. No, it just means I have a belly. You know? Right. Um, and my mother had a belly also. And I've also had a child. So, you know, to me, like, all of this, like, you know, represents where I am, different things that have happened in my life, um, and, and that kind of stuff. And when I think about it in those terms, it's like, so what? Yeah. I'd love yeah. to compare and contrast, Aaron. What are you experiencing any dramatic like shifts in your mindset or anything about getting older? Is this something that you kind of feel like? Like I find I go into situations and somehow I'm, an, I'm apologizing that I'm like a middle aged woman. <laughs> and it's so weird. Like, <laughs> why the hell am I doing that? You know? And so I'm just wondering if, Aaron, you have a different experience or kind of a same, a similar experience. So what I notice is, uh, is a couple things. One is, um, it's, it's much more internal, right? It's not, uh, it's not really talked about, right? But it sort of comes from one space of like, oh, my body is just getting older. Like, I can't do some of the athletic things that I used to do in the way that I did them, right? So I'm not, mm-hmm. um, an 18 year old anymore if I go out and play basketball or, um, do some of those things. Like, I just, my, mobility level is not there and that doesn't ha- I think that has nothing to do with my body type it just has to do with um the the knees and the and the and the the body of a of a 44 year old i also notice my reaction time is slower mm. and and so i notice it in a couple ways one is my son and i will, will, will like play in the house and like, we'll try and score soccer goals on each other. Right. So I stand right by the door and, and he like kicks the ball at me or I kick the ball at him. And like, I, I noticed like, Oh, I would have totally gotten that 20 years ago. <laughs> like I, my hand would have totally hit that. Uh, so it's just not as quick. The other time I notice it is we also play video games together. And there are a couple video games where like the timing is like, you, you got to hit the button at the right time. I can't do it. Like it's just, mm-hmm. and, and like my brain is there, mm-hmm. but like the reaction time is just a little bit slower where in the past I would have totally hit that button at the right time. So I, I notice it in, in a couple different ways. Um, and it, especially the athletic part of it, like pisses me off. I get, mm-hmm. I, I'm upset, you know, like, oh, I wish I could, you know, do those things like I was, like I was 18. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not doing them, but it just means like I need to like change my mindset when I start doing them mm-hmm. and remind myself, dude, you're not 18. Like <laughs> don't run out and start playing soccer like you're 18 mm-hmm. um, or anything like that. Cause like I will, I'll be the guy who comes in and like with a, you know, busted knee because like I went too hard. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, the, but, 
I don't think it has to do with necessarily like having gray hairs, which I and I don't have that many, right? I still have a full head of hair. You got a few. I got a few, right? <laughs> um but um but like, you know, so I think those aging things are, are at least for me not that not that prominent, right? Um I don't butt up against them that often. And again, I think that I think that's male privilege. I really do. I think that's um you know, no one's telling me that you know or I'm not getting a message from society that um that I'm I'm I I need to do something differently as I get older. Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting Michelle, are you getting those kind of messages cuz I I know that a lot of middle-aged women and myself included, we start to have that experience of becoming invisible. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I have that. Um, I have those feelings often and, and I have to do a lot of self-talk to, to really take that, you know, to break that down because there are days, you know, when I'm like, well, what the hell wants to hear from me? I'm 51, you know, like, especially, I feel like so many people in the industry that we're in are significantly younger, you know, and I am like, uh, I'm not 20 or 30. Like, you know, there's a big gap between, you know, we have a similar message, but I'm delivering it from a different decade, you know? So it's, it's sometimes I remind myself, you know, I'm like, yeah, but you still have something really important to say. And what you have uh, is a lot of experience behind you, that wisdom that, you know, is very, very important. So I have to talk to myself quite often and remind myself that I still have very important contributions to make and that my age is really wisdom and it's not a bad thing. Um, but, you know, I'm human. So I, you know, get caught up in it sometimes too, but it's something that when you said the word invisible, I felt like a little twitch um, because it's something that definitely comes up for me, you know, uh, and it's something, like I said, that I have to really talk to myself and say, it's really okay. You still have important contributions to make. And there are people that only want to work with people that are younger, you know, and then there are people that, you know, want uh, a more seasoned person that's been around and has more experience uh, that they can relate to. So I think that there's somebody for everybody, you know, and I always have to keep focusing on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, which is, I think the tragedy is not so much that, you know, we're having to deal with body changes, like big deal, right? Like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. happens. It's more like we have to convince ourselves that we are still relevant and yes. viable humans. And that in yes. fact, like men are sort of regarded as like, oh, they're getting older and they have wisdom and experience. And mm -hmm. I don't see that translating to women. It's sort of like, well, you know, I, I, everything everything bad is named after moms mom jeans soccer mom you know right. it's like yes. and and yes. or, or like kind of denigrating so and there's a quote from sarah silverman and i used it in one of my blog posts one day but um she said as soon as a woman gets to an age where she has opinions and she's vital and she's strong she's systematically shamed into hiding under a rock and i thought mm -hmm. when i read that it was like exactly how it felt like I am older and somehow because I'm not young and fitting into the cultural beauty standards that somehow my work is less relevant. Now, I, mm -hmm. I know that's not true on mm -hmm. an objective basis, but I do think that um, there is, that's sort of how we're treated to some degree. And so how do we, I guess my question is how, how do we fight against that? <laughs> that's like a huge question. Yeah, I think it's a great question and, and it's obviously not easy to answer. And I think the answer will be different for everybody, you know, because we are unique, you know, we all have different experiences and we're drawing from those different experiences. Uh, for me, like I said, I just continue to remind myself. Uh, first of all, I surround myself with people of all ages, you know, so I, I find I love talking to young people, you know, in their 20s, 30s, whatever, teenagers, Whoever I am, I feel blessed to meet. I love to talk to them, and and I can connect with them on some level. I also love to talk to 
to older people. And I have, you know, people like that in my life. I, some of my closest friends throughout my life have always been older women. You know, so I have always um, enjoyed speaking to older women and men, but it just so happens that my closest, closest friends were probably 25 years older than me when I was like, even in my 20s. And I just got so much from speaking with them. I found that they were so filled with wisdom. And uh, they reminded me that life doesn't end, you know, when you turn 30, 40 or whatever, you know, that it keeps going and that we keep growing, you know, into ourselves. And that's just, I always found that very optimistic and uh, enlightening. For me, that's like one way is to, you know, be friendly with people of all ages and also to understand that we can learn from everybody at, at any age, you know, not to close ourselves off. So just thinking that, oh, well, someone at that age, what are they going what to, what am I going to learn from them? You know, and I can learn from everybody. You know, as long as my heart and mind are open to that, I can learn from everybody that comes across the path. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a piece where we as older women kind of need to say to younger women, hey, um, life does not end at 40. Yes. Um, don't be afraid of aging because what you give up in your ability to adhere to the cultural beauty standards or whatever, um, I, I mean, I've gained... The, the amount of wisdom and confidence I feel like I have as an older woman is like well worth the trade. Yes. Um, and Erin, even you probably feel as you're older now, you're way more confident than you were as a young person, I'm guessing. Totally. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's the amount of knowledge and, and wisdom that we have. And when I hear myself talking to clients, sometimes I'm like, wow, I'm like so wise. <laughs> you yes, know? yes. And I could not have told you this information in my 20s. <laughs> exactly. I was a hot mess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel exactly the same way. And, and it's just important, I think, that we continue to remind ourselves that we are relevant. And that, it's again, it's that number thing. You know, whereas I... I'm always telling people how old I am. Like, not like, oh, I'm 51, you know, but like if we're having a conversation and they start, you know, saying something and, and it seems like it's irrelevant to the conversation, I'll say, well, you know, I'm 51, you know, and they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, you know, so it just kind of, I think it like resets like those beliefs that oh, by a certain age, you have to do X, Y, Z and, or you can't do that anymore. And I'm like, I don't believe that way. You know, I don't, I feel that, if you feel good doing something and you can still do it, why not? And then in regards to my age, I also feel that um, I keep losing this train of thought. It's really frustrating. Um, see, this, this is part of the aging process. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, um, it's just that, you know, I do still have these important things that I want. Oh, I know what it was, my needs. I know more about what my needs are now than I did when I was, you know, in 20s, 30s, 40s. Like, and the best thing about it is not only am I more in touch with what I need, but I'm not afraid to say what the hell I need. You know, whereas before in my previous lives, it was like, yeah, but what are people going to think? And I don't know. And blah, blah, blah. And now I'm like, okay, this isn't working for me. And uh, is there something that we can do to make it work better for all of us so that all of our needs are met or at least compromised? Whereas in the past, I would have been too afraid to do that. You know, and now I understand that, you know, having our needs met is really important, you know. And so when we can, we uh, it's nice to be able to speak up and have that confidence that you're talking about, Donna, to not be afraid to say it's okay to speak out. You know, it, it really is okay. Uh, we have we can we can give ourselves permission to do that. And I didn't do that in my twenties. I know for sure I didn't, uh, and probably not even in my thirties. Totally, same here. And yeah, that I can ask for help. And also, yeah. I love saying things like, "I'm not going to do that for no reason other than I'm a grown ass adult, and I get to <laughs> choose what I want to do and what I don't want to do." And that yeah. is so freeing. And mm -hmm. you know. Of course, we should be able to say that at any age, but I found as a 20-something and even as a 30-something, I f somehow didn't give myself permission. And so yes. part of getting older has been like, give yourself permission, just as we talk about giving ourselves permission to eat, mm -hmm. like give yourself permission to ask for help. Yes. You know, if you need it, give yourself permission to say no to things that you don't want. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Which is, yes. yeah, yeah. And I think it, Yeah. I think the other, you know, 
thing that is that relates to this, right, is if someone's coming, someone's living in a larger body, right, they're already feeling oppressed, Mm -hmm. right, and silenced and, you know, invisible uh, to our society. And then as they get older, right, especially, again, what we're talking about is this a, a, a difference between how men are perceived as they get older and women are perceived as they get older, but especially for, for women, right. It's, it's this notion of, okay, well now, now I'm also oppressed on this other level, right. I'm Mm -hmm. further invisible because of my age. And, um, and for men, you know, maybe that that they're, they're still invisible because of their weight, but like this age thing might not butt up against them as much, but, but again, it could be different depending on the individual. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about is, you know, when people do find out our age, sometimes, you know, it seems like the the comment is, oh, well, you don't look blank, mm-hmm. right? You don't look mm-hmm. for, you know, someone, you know, I told someone I was 44 the other day and they're like, oh, you look 34. And I was like, yeah. well, maybe this is just what 44 looks like. In our head, we think it should yeah. be like already have a cane and and um yeah. and in a wheelchair right um mm-hmm. but uh, again we we're, we're we talk about age with a lot of freedom where we don't talk about weight as with as much freedom oh hey i'm 250 pounds you don't look like you're 250 pounds right we we sort of have these conversations around age where it's it's very different and so i'm wondering just as we sort of think about body um our body image is setting boundaries with how people define our age Right. The same way we have boundaries with people defining our our size. Right. Do we need to develop similar boundaries with how people are viewing our age? Yeah, because what is a 44 year old person supposed to look like? Exactly. Right. And what is a 51 year old woman supposed to look like? And what size is her body supposed to be? I don't know. People say, how old is so-and-so? I say, I am not. I have no idea that I've never been good at those kind of guessing games. I, I don't know, you know, and we all know that, you know, 250 pounds on one person could look completely different on the other person. Exactly. You know, exactly. Everybody is different. And the idea is that we're not all supposed to look the same. And one 44 year old person is not supposed to look like the next 44 year old person. I, I don't. Right. And then it gets back to why does that even matter? Exactly. Exactly. Why? I mean, and and I think w- one our conversation to understand why why it matters, right? Right. Um, but I think the other bigger picture, right, is why the fuck does it have to matter? Right. Why? Yes. F- well, yes. and and it's so funny. People say to me because I'm also letting my hair go gray. Like I've never dyed my hair actually, so uh-huh. it's just coming Which is in. Amazing. That's amazing to me. <laughs> there was like, I was like wow. I was like That's I'm already <laughs> I'm already de- dealing with the diet. And I'm challenged enough in getting a good haircut. Like I cannot throw <laughs> dyeing my hair on top of this. That's kind of how I felt. Uh, uh, and so I'm just letting it. And I, I always assumed I'd let it go gray. But mm-hmm. my my partner, and he he has allowed me to call him Mr. Daring on this because I'm dare to not dye it. But Mr. Daring? <laughs> Mr. Daring. He's like, don't use my name. He's very <laughs> introverted. So he <laughs> is like way into just like do what's natural, man. Like... Let your hair go gray. I love it. He goes, it's just another hair color. I'm like, oh, maybe it is. So then I kind of decided, like, I'm not going to dye my hair, but it hasn't gone that gray. So the irony is when people say, like, oh, is that your natural hair hair color? I'm like, yeah, this is this is it. See, I have a gray streak that I'm super proud of. And they're like, oh, you're so lucky. It's, like, hardly gray at all. And I was like, wow, is that is it lucky to not have gray hair? Like, yeah, yeah I would have been like, oh, you're you're like – I feel like there's a lot of health problems if I was going to be lucky that I just wouldn't have gotten, <laughs> you know, if I were yeah, choosing. Yeah. Like, I feel like hair is just like, whatever, who cares? Like, I feel like, oh, you're so lucky. You're rich beyond everybody's wildest dreams. <laughs> right. But again, yeah. I think this feeds into like this notion of like how those subtle comments and those are accepted, right? right affect our body image. Yeah. yeah. And Aaron, especially as we get older. Has anybody told yeah. you, Aaron, that you're lucky to not have a lot of gray hair? Uh. That a little bit, but I get oh, okay. a lot of comments about how lucky I am to have a full head of hair. Right. Yeah, I get a right. lot of comments about, yeah. oh my, I would wish, I wish I could have your hair or, yeah. um, you know, especially when I get my hair cut, like, dude, you have a lot of hair. I was like, 
no shit. I got a lot of hair. It's thick. It's full. And like, sometimes I hate it. I'm sorry. But like, yeah, yeah, no, I have a lot of hair. I don't need you telling me I have a lot of hair. Yeah. Right. Right. It's funny because I said earlier that my husband has a full head of hair. He's completely silver, you know, silver gray. And I I look at him and I say, honey, people, a lot of men would kill. They would rather have silver hair than no hair. So, you know, it's like, okay, so, so your hair is silver. So what, you know, and you have a lot of hair. I talk about a lot of hair, Aaron. I've got a lot of hair, you know, like I've always had a lot of hair. It's curly. It's thick. It's just, it is what it is, you know, Yeah. but it's funny because in my early forties, I used to, until my early forties, I used to blow my hair out. Like it was torture. And then I don't know, something happened and I was on spring, well, my son was on spring break and I, we were going hiking and I didn't have time to blow it out. And I said, F it, I'm not doing it. So I didn't. And then I never did it again. <laughs> it was just like, I embraced my curly hair after 40 some odd years. And let me tell you, wow, it was nice just to say, just let it go. Yeah. And so I think you're just hitting natural. Yeah. You're hitting on something that I've heard. I have heard from a lot of middle-aged la- ladies women and um that i'm also experiencing which is like you kind of age out of this you age out of the beauty standards or whatever um mm-hmm. and it's freeing in some ways where you can say like i don't need to look a certain way so i i have heard i don't know if that's kind of been a, your experiences as you get older like i'm just gonna look how i want to look and it doesn't matter yeah. Like, it doesn't matter that straight hair is fashionable. It doesn't yes. matter that dark brown hair is is preferable somehow to, you know, graying hair. Right. And, right. It, and there's a freedom, to be sure, if you're able to embrace it. Like, I think if you're able to embrace this idea that you get to be whatever you want and look however yes. you want and dress however you want, that yes. is going to make aging just a whole lot easier. Well, still val... Yeah. yeah. I mean, even though I have multiple colored hair right now, it's still like, who says I have to have one colored hair? Yeah. Nobody yeah, exactly. Says I have to. No. You know, eventually it's going to, and eventually it's going to be, you know, probably salt and pepper or whatever it's going to be. I mean, when I see women that it appears that they've let their hair grow completely natural without seeming like I'm accosting them, I approach them and I say, can I ask you, is your hair natural? And I just did it last week at, um, it was like at a farmer's market. And this woman and I had like this 15 to 20 minute long conversation about her hair, which I thought was beautiful. It was completely natural. And she told me she was like 45 and she just got sick and tired of dying it. And, and I, it was just such a great conversation. And she said, I'm just so tired of having to do things because I feel like people say you have to. And I said, that's exactly how I feel about it. You know, you probably and it was just a, it's a nice conversation to talk to women. I've done that two times now. And both conversations are very nourishing. And both women were like, well, if men can do it, why can't me? And I'm like, right on. You probably changed her life. Maybe, you know, I mean, it's funny because when she told me her age, like she kind of said it like whisper and I said, oh, I'm 51. And she looked at me and I was like, I'm not afraid of my age. (laughs) It's just like, it's the whole thing about, you know, I wrote down so I wouldn't forget, like, I feel like embracing this whole aging process was kind of like what I went through when I gave up dieting and that, and, and that I felt like I was swimming upstream. You know, because everybody else was like, well, you have to be on a diet. What do you mean? You you know, you eat to fullness and you don't, you don't have any like boundaries or restrictions anymore. And I'm like, that's what I mean. I don't have that anymore. And it makes people very uncomfortable. People that aren't ready for that message are very uncomfortable with that because that's all they know. And so I feel people feel very similarly when I talk about the aging process and that it's a natural thing and that our bodies change and that our hair, in many cases, our hair changes, blah, blah, blah. And I find that it makes some people very uncomfortable. And and to me, it's very, very similar to the whole diet thing and giving up dieting. You know, it's that swimming upstream thing. And I'm just like, it is what it is, but I'm not going to do what everyone wants me to do just because that's what they say I'm supposed to do. Right. I hear so many parallel skills um, yeah. in, in doing those things. And I, I'm so I, I and I wrote down um, swimming upstream because it, it is like it's you're a counterculturalist 
uh, like a yeah. rebel um, doing some of these things. I'm wondering if either of you have worked with anyone, because um, I personally haven't, but who's um, actually come at it from a different angle, like maybe embraced the aging process first and then mm. sort of like saying, hey, I'm now I'm ready to give up diet culture as a part of that aging process. Because um, I think that would be an interesting experiment as well. Or that experience. It's cool. That is something, wow. I've never worked with anyone that's gone through it in that direction, but it's it's interesting. Uh, but it also makes me think of the women that I've worked with who have been like in their 60s who have been dieting for the majority of their lives. And when they are awakened to intuitive eating, they're like, holy shit, I can't believe I just spent x number of years dieting and i have all this freedom now and i could have had that x amount of years ago and i i i wasn't i wasn't there you yeah. know yeah it, that, it's an interesting sort of like a study for someone to conduct like body like um uh adhering to like age appropriate uh beauty standards uh -huh. and body acceptance and diet yeah diet behavior yeah yeah, yeah and I, that would be really cool. I, I haven't had any clients that had that experience, but I have talked to women who went, you know, have gotten older and as a part of dealing with that, definitely was like they were like, I'm not gonna diet anymore. I'm done. Like too yeah. much has been wasted. Yes. Yeah. So what's the what what do you think the best advice is for sort of embracing your age? Part of it you talked about doing some self talk. Yeah. Uh Reminding ourselves like we need to with our bodies that, that just as we come in all shapes and sizes and that's totally okay, we all come, we all have different contributions at different ages and, you know, that we, we're still relevant as we get older and that wisdom, you know, I don't like to take that for granted in myself or in others. You know, there's, there, there are such, there's such important information that people that have experienced, you know, more life can share with us if we're open to that. So I think just keeping keeping our minds and our hearts open and, and seeing again that there are benefits to uh, speaking with people of all different ages and we can always learn something from people. You know? And there's relevancy in every age, just like there's people are relevant at all different shapes and sizes. Yeah, I love that. And I love the wisdom part of it, too, that like yeah. we have this inner wisdom and there's always more that we need to learn and mm -hmm. and and also accept. But that starting with an acknowledgement of the wisdom we already have is I think is very empowering. Yeah. yeah. And, and to not cancel that out and just think, oh, well, no one wants to hear me. I'm old. You know, I think it's just the opposite. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And come into things with this idea that we are relevant. And, yes. and that we have, and don't apologize. And that's something I've got to stop doing is just kind of apologizing for my age somehow, which is like some weird reflex. Um, I and do it's, it sometimes too. I, I find that in general, I apologize too often. So that's something that I'm becoming extremely conscious of. Yeah. And I, obviously, if I've done something wrong, I, I, I think it's appropriate to apologize. But I find myself apologizing for like silly little things. And I'm like, do I really need to be doing that anymore? You know, I really need to keep that in check. So I just, for me, just in general, the whole apology thing needs to, uh, I yeah, need to I, put some reins on that. I, I, I'm sorry. I do the same thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm, can, I'm Canadian, so saying sorry is coded into my DNA. So <laughs> I'm Jewish, so it's it's there too. Close second. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Michelle, it's been so great to talk to you about this topic that has kind of been on my mind and also your mind. And and we had a meeting of the minds, and yeah. we say go go forth and age boldly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and with pride, with it, pride. Exactly. Don't you hide. Know, don't hide your age. Yeah, it's, and don't apologize for it. It is what it is. And guess what? It's going to happen to everybody. Yeah, if we're lucky. <laughs> you know, that's like one of those things. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for that reminder. If we're lucky, if it happens, lucky. right? Right. Yeah. Yes, so, if we're lucky. So then my parting shot is like, can we get rid of like the anti-aging cream? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to get some pro aging cream. It's called sandpaper. Right. Or like, 
and or just like you know anti like you, it's impossible how right. can they how can they get away with selling right. anti-aging cream yeah anti-aging cream that's false advertising die young there <laughs> you're not gonna stop <laughs> me from aging yeah. and why would you yeah. yeah i was just watching something with cindy crawford and you know she like i think she turned, she did turn back the clock and i think she must drink some aldehyde to stay looking like that <laughs> which and we I'm don't promote like, yeah i'm like whatever you can sell all the cream you want i have no i am not buying any of it i mean yes i use a moisturizer but i'm not like oh you know use this and under the eye and this and that. i'm like whatever i i don't want to use that i use cream because i don't like when my face feels tight after i wash it exactly you know, it's not because i'm like trying to reverse the aging process who am I kidding? Again, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Comfort issue. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks again. And um, tell us where people can find you. Oh, okay. Uh, my website is my name. It's uh, Michelle V-I-N-A Baltzis, uh, Michelle Vina Baltzis dot com. And I have a really great uh, Facebook page that I absolutely love. It's a private group and it's called the No Sister Diet Hood. And we have some really fun conversations in there, uh, some goal setting stuff, just some really intimate uh, conversations that help to nourish me and a lot of the other women. And uh, yeah, that's that's where people can find me. I have a lot of different stuff on my website that they can, you know, a lot of free resources, some online courses, coaching, group coaching, fun stuff. Fun. And I'm in your group yeah. too. So I love being able to connect with you there. Yeah, me too. I yeah. love your group too. It's, it's nice to... Yeah you know, work with other people who are doing this type of important, important work to help men and women feel like they're enough, no matter what their age is, no matter what their size is, no matter what color their hair is. You know, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Very, very important work to have to be doing it. Absolutely. And we'll put links to all those in our show notes. Okay. okay. Cool. All Thank right. you. All right. Well, thanks, Michelle. We'll talk to you again someday. Thank you. And again, thank you for this opportunity to uh, have this conversation with you guys and for sharing this and for all the work you're doing. You're welcome. <laughs>